Hello, everyone. Thanks to the Architectural League for hosting this video and for, um, for everyone for watching. Today, I'm going to talk about assessing surveillance, militarized infrastructure on the Tohono O'odham Nation, an ongoing research and visualization project that my collaborator, Nina Kolarotnik, um, who's currently in Vienna, and I have been working on for the past five years and for which we were awarded the Norden Travel Fund in 2016. This work has also been done in collaboration with Tohono O'odham tribal elder Ophelia Rivas. And so today I'm going to discuss the context um, in which we initially sought to make an intervention um, and with, when we initially applied for the Norden grant, um, the research that that grant then allowed us to do, and the continued development of the project um, after that grant period. Specifically, I'll be presenting a series of mappings and an alternative environmental assessment that we produced as the result of our research um, and also discuss some of our working methodology. Um, so the Tohono O'odham um, Nation is a Native American reservation that's located on the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, the Tohono O'odham traditional lands encompass thousands of square miles of, of Sonoran Desert in a territory um, that, now, that straddles what is now the border between Arizona in the U.S. Um, and Sonora, Mexico. And so here's um, an image of this, this landscape. Tribal members have historically passed fluidly through this terrain, moving between seasonal villages, harvesting saguaro cactus, traveling to the Gulf of California, and performing spiritual walks or runs. Freedom to move across the U.S.-Mexico border is vital for both maintaining traditional Otham culture and also to allow Otham people on both sides of the border um, to access different services like, um, you know, going to the grocery store, or health care services, to see family, um, or to even access kind of their own land or homes on, on either side of the border. However, border militarization uh, policies over the last decade have changed this historically open terrain and constricted the mobility of its inhabitants. This has produced an incredibly complex and increasingly tight condition of border militarization, one in which divergent understandings of property, connectivity, and permanence have created an impasse in which indigenous rights to the land are seen as incompatible with the perceived demands of national security. In 2014, Customs and Border Protection proposed to build 16 integrated fixed surveillance towers in the Tohono O'odham Nation along its southern border with Mexico and its western border with the Organ Pipe Cactus National Monument. Um, and you can see the map of that, that here. The proposed towers were laid out in a curved line following the U.S.-Mexico border and turning at its juncture with the Organ Pipe Cactus Monument to extend along its border with the Tohono O'odham Nation um, into the interior of the U.S. And so when we first began this research in 2015, CBP was in the midst of negotiations with the tribal government over the towers um, and had just issued a draft of an environmental assessment stating that the towers would have no significant impact on the Otham landscape or people. Um, and here's that assessment here. But as widespread opposition to the towers by tribal members indicated, this was not the case. Facing the situation um, after an, an initial trip and meeting with Ophelia Rivas, who we've been working with, the question we asked ourselves when formulating this project and starting to think about um, you know, doing this work and, and applying for this grant was how the expertise and resources of architects and scholars could be used to advocate against the towers. So through representations of current and proposed border enforcement infrastructure um, and their different techniques of surveillance, our project works towards an understanding of how this infrastructure operates in different administrative zones, through confl conflictual understandings of land, and through an impact on existing cultural and ecological systems. What we wanted to show was that it was impossible to separate cultural, ecological, and social effects of the towers, um, as the framework of the environmental assessment suggests when it does, in fact, separate um, impact into these kind of classificatory rubrics. We also wanted to show that when analyzed through awesome ways of using the land and connection to it, as well as just through kind of basic understandings of, of privacy, the impact of the towers is indeed profound. 
We also wanted to expand the notion of impact by reading the towers as infrastructure. In other words, as connected to multiple systems of policing and surveillance already installed on the nation. So things like checkpoints, new roadways, increased officers on the ground, detention centers, um, embedded ground sensors, etc. As well as connected to a long history of federal attempts to control and expropriate indigenous lands in this region. So structurally, the towers are, are pretty straightforward, um, as you can see here. They're 120 to 180 feet high. They include a base with a propane tank, generator, solar panels, and an equipment shelter. They're equipped with a range of surveillance equipment, including radio frequency radar, long-range video, microwave communication receivers that transmit up to 40 miles, as well as spotlights and laser illuminators. Um, and of course, CBP did not provide any information regarding precisely where the towers would be built. So in order to find and record their exact locations, um, because there was no GPS or GIS data given in the assessment, we went out into the field with Ophelia Rivas and looked for the metal markers that were already pushed into the ground to mark the tower's footprint. Okay, so here you can see us looking uh, for these markers. And then the markers themselves here, which are quite small. So after first locating where the towers would in fact be located, we researched the effects that the various technologies that compose them would have. And this was information also emitted from the environmental assessment. We then spoke to community members in the Guvo district, which is where we were working, about what they believed impact um, would mean and look like should these towers be built in terms of privacy rights, uh, ceremony, and impacts to plants and animals. After learning more about the towers and going through this process of locating them, we ultimately decided to intervene in the environmental assessment itself by creating an alternative environmental assessment. So through analytical mappings and visualization, as well as oral history-based writings, we aim to create a document that actually represents the holistic um, impact that these towers will have in the context of Tehono Otham traditional knowledge and way of life um, as they were articulated to us in these interviews. So then supporting the analytical mappings and visualizations, the alternative assessment mirrored the structures of the CBP issued document, but through its content interrogated the classification that the environmental assessment process set up. We did this to directly comment upon the framework of the assessment and to create a recognizable format around which conversations with tribal government and potentially CBP um, could be based. This alternative assessment was also intended as an activist tool to help community members rally opposition to the towers in their local district or within tribal council and just to kind of um, raise awareness about the effects that hadn't been um, previously published. So as an example of this language, while the Department of Homeland Security um, and Customs and Border Protections environmental as assessment explains the impact of not building the towers as such, um, so no action alternative since construction activities associated with the proposed IFT would not occur. The no action alternative would have no direct effect, either beneficial or adverse on cultural resources. Under the no action alternative, USBP detection and threat classification capabilities would not be enhanced and operational efficiency would not be improved. Thus, the anticipated deterrence of cross-border violator traffic in the project area would not occur. Um, our alternative impact statement reframes the very notion of no action in terms of cultural continuity and environmental preservation, saying no action would not accept militarization status quo. It would be an act of resistance against custom and border protections, occupation of Otham homeland, which is to say that no action is in fact a taking of action that will preserve um, Otham way of life, allowing Otham responsibility for and stewardship of the Takbavak Mountains and Shotgun Valley to continue. And these are the, the regions where the towers would be. So specifically, the no action alternative would not disrupt the migration patterns of white-tailed deer. Therefore, the deer hunting ceremonies in the Takbavak would not be interrupted. Deer move through the mountains seasonally to graze and mate. 
Otham hunters are intimately familiar with these migration patterns and call for deer, for deer with songs guarded by secrecy. With no action, Otham hunters would also be able to continue hunting ceremonies and songs across a sacred landscape without fear of being recorded on video. Um, it would not disrupt the habitat of javelinas who range in the Tokvavok and are traditional source of Otham food, would not uproot saguaro cacti, a sacred plant whose fruit is harvested by the Otham, nor would it damage the ironwood tree, which is used in medicinal teas. It would not further record and document secret ceremonies that have been conducted for centuries in the Shardgum Valley, further record, document, and discourage the practices of daily life that create connectivity to land, violate privacy of residents living in communities near proposed surveillance areas, further deface ancient petroglyphs near proposed tower sites, which had already been done, uh, damage health of humans and animals, particularly those of long-nosed bats, through electromagnetic radiation. There is no existing data on this specific tower typology. So CBP is in essence testing a new surveillance regime and new surveillance technologies on the Tehanuatham Nation, continuing a history of using the apparently deserted landscapes of the Southwest as a laboratory. Nor would it leave remains vulnerable to exhumation, customs and border protection, has already uncovered ancestral bones in the border fence construction. Boring 16 60-foot foundations will undoubtedly uncover more. Um, and this is just a recent development, but in building the, um, the border wall now in the neighboring Oregon Pipe Cactus Park, um, a burial site has been um, dynamited. So this, this is an ongoing practice. And so here we saw language as a critical tool of the environmental assessment. And as we wanted our words to reflect the conversations we had had with community members, we also wanted our visualizations to not only provide critical information omitted from the original assessment, but to represent impact in an interconnected way. Uh, so what we see here is the actual operating range of these proposed towers in the Guvo district area. We can see that there are multiple overlaps in the, the radii some of which are captured, um, so some areas are captured by up to four towers simultaneously. It also reveals the coverage blind spots created in the projected shadow zones of the natural topography as seen from the tower location, so the areas that they're trying to, to capture and the ones that they fail to do. And so what we did to create this was create a 3D model of the landscape and a model of the tower, and then placed a virtual light source on top of it um, where radar and video equipment would be mounted kind of in reality and let the computer calculate which exact areas of the landscape um, would be light rays falling within a 20 mile radius. Um, and so these were the places that we uh, predicted would fall under these kind of um, surveillance radii. In addition to the surveillance, uh, surveillance equipment's radii and overlaps, what we wanted to achieve with this mapping is also to create a visualization of the tower locations that include villages, streets, and place names for better orientation um, and to enable the viewer to make out the distance of the tower locations to inhabited areas and villages on the nation, uh, which is also information that the um, proposed project provided to the community didn't do. So as you can see here, there's no sense of, of um, proximity to, to villages labeled. And what had been provided in the EA draft, again, was this large scale map of all the tower locations. This, um, and then these very close zoom ins of each tower's um, fenced footprint. So there was no scale in between. Um, and so we wanted to kind of show that the scale in a more recognizable way um, for people who lived there. Uh, we also wanted to make sure that the map uh, extended into Mexico because um, those are also awesome traditional lands, but also the surveillance equipment's reach would extend into Mexico as well. Um, and so we also started to look at the, uh, the impact of each individual tower. So the following slides are an attempt to visualize the impact of the, um, the towers in Tohono O'odham tribal lands. Um, but also the impact to all living things within these lands. Um, and so these visualizations speak to the interconnectedness of wildlife and people and the very extensive and delicate ecosystem Tehonoatha members are trying to protect. 
The drawings will show a selection of native plants and animals, their locations and habitats, ancestral sites, ceremonial routes, as well as today's Otham settlements, and how those elements are interwoven with the Otham traditional year and ceremonial cycle. Um, and as explained by Ophelia Rivas uh, to us, the Otham traditional year is based on patterns of the earth and represents a continuous and interrelated cycle of traditional practices, so it's, it's cyclical. The drawing represents uh, also that there are no hierarchies in terms of site locations, living beings, or specific periods within the year. Um, and these maps have been produced in close, in close collaboration with Ophelia Rivas um, and through this traditional knowledge that she was sharing with us. Um, so we're zooming in here to Tower 0452 um, and the traditional plants uh, surrounding it. So Tower Site 0452 holds areas with saguaro cactus as well as many medicinal plants. The blooming of the saguaro cactus, the ripening of the saguaro fruit and its harvesting represents the start of the traditional year and the start of, um, of ceremony. Uh, ceremonies that are performed by Tehanuathan people at many uh, of the ancestral sites within this tower range, visualized here. And these add to um, the, the practices and um, of these, um, this adds to kind of the, the significance and practices of these sites. Um, and there are also habitats to eagles, javelinas, jaguar, and pronghorn sheep, as well as water holes and deer migration routes. And so these things are, are interrelated, the ceremony and the, the animals that live there. And so finally, here we see the present day Tehonoatham settlements to be impacted by this tower's um, surveillance radius. The traditional year clearly shows that there's no time within the year where the landscape is not used and speaks to the relationship between these environmental elements, uh, for example, ceremony and hunting seasons. And since the exact location of ancestral sites, ceremonial walks, and areas of medicinal plants cannot be pinpointed on the map, the possibility of partial georeferencing of sites and practices shown in planned view is here reduced to elevation views. It presents a view of the landscape that is familiar to those knowing and living it, members of the Otham community, uh, because they will be the ones that recognize the shapes and specificities of the hillsides and identify them as, as sites of lived tradition um, and of communities. Um, and so at the time that we were conducting this research, we also saw that surveying had had, um, already had an impact on the land and daily life, especially when taken into consideration with a broader view of surveillance infrastructure. Uh, so we found that it was no coincidence that along with the construction of towers came um, small detention centers and facilities for people apprehended crossing the border. Um, it also requires little stretch of the imagination to understand that the infrastructure apparently needed to support construction and maintenance of the tower. So like these truck paths that are crossing the desert, the movement of border patrol officers to nearby stations, the tracks of housing and trailers and mobile offices are also quite useful in pursuing what CBP terms items of interest. So be that local residents, US citizens, migrants entering the country legally or illegally. And the persistent harassment of the population on the borderlands. Um, so one example of this is the staging areas, for example, that were used to build the border fence, which is where kind of heavy construction equipment are put um, in this kind of operation site are now just being reused in the tower project. So this infrastructure kind of um, perpetuates itself. Um, another example is, is the, the kind of bodies on the ground that it brings with it. Um, so in our approximate calculations, there were over um, 1,200 CBP agents working in the three um, kind of stations that have jurisdiction over the reservation. Um, and the population of the nation that actually lives on the reservation is about 13,000. So it, it is roughly like one border patrol agent for every 10 Otham residents. Um, and while of course not all the agents are on duty at the same time or always working on the reservation because the stations encompass other areas, 
This does give a sense of how saturated this so-called sparse region is by law enforcement. Um, and this is what it's meant by persistent surveillance, which is the term that CBP uses to describe the capability of these towers. Um, and so an infrastructure of surveillance, which includes patrolling bodies and its attendant culture of fear, has already changed a tribal relationship to the land with significant cultural consequences. So the towers, like the border fence, become material mechanisms to assimilate tribal members into Western culture with destructive consequences. The increased presence of border patrol agents, for instance, has caused um, often people, particularly younger people, to spend more and more time at home instead of outside on the land, um, you know, doing any number of things. Um, and so we kind of gather this through conversation um, with many people. And so by claiming the tribal common land of the reservation as a space of surveillance and mili militarization, as property of the federal government and within its sovereign territory, Border Patrol pushes members into a space that they can easily define as private property of their own, so the house. Um, and by forcing members into a, a lifestyle that's really centered around private property, border surveillance not only has immediate consequences in terms of physical and psychological well-being, it also ruptures intergenerational ties and traditional knowledge and results in cultural disconnection to the land for its inhabitants. So through these mappings and the written document, we wanted to expand the ways that impact was articulated within the framework of the environmental assessment uh, to begin to understand and unpack how the towers operated within a much more extensive infrastructure of border militarization that has been ongoing on the nation, but also as part of perhaps an epistemological infrastructure that forms the basis of the environmental assessment itself. We wanted to figure opposition or no action as an act of refusal and an assertion of the rights of indigenous peoples to regulate movement on their lands on their own terms. Most importantly, we wanted to create a document that actually represented the extent of holistic impact that the towers will have in terms of Otham traditional knowledge and way of life as told to us by activists, elders, community members, um, kind of youth activist organizations. And we did this, um, and, and so we ultimately ended up presenting the, the maps and this document both to the district council in Guvo, uh, which is where we were primarily working, as well as the tribal government. Um, and a more simple format of community engagement that we used was um, this flyer that, that we made that Ophelia distributed at Community Day in the Guvo district. Um, in 2017, we led a mapping workshop with students from the Program in Critical, Curatorial, and Conceptual Practices at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation, and from the Studies in Indigenous Borderlands Program at the Chehenawatham Community College, focusing on issues of conservation, sovereignty, cultural landscapes, and surveillance. And so in the workshop, students work collaboratively collaboratively over a week to produce maps about um, imbricated landscapes of surveillance, migration, and conservation um, on and adjacent to the nation. And these were presented at a session that was open to community members and where we invited activists and elders to give feedback on their work. Um, and these are some visualizations we made in, for the purposes of our presentation with the government to show kind of uh, what the impact of the towers would be kind of through the most dominant way they perceive the landscape. Uh, and we also did this uh, kind of place them in a Google Earth simulation. Uh, however, last year the Tribal Council approved the towers as an attempt to forestall the construction of a more intrusive border barrier and wall that is, is now uh, being built ever closer to the nation. And as the Vice Chairman Berlin Jose put it directly, we're only as sovereign as the federal government will allow us to be. Um, and so as you can see, the reasons why the towers are, were approved are complex, that the tribe is dependent on the federal government for funding. Um, there are also many political divisions within the districts where the towers were being built. So Guva, where we were working, opposed them, but Chukukuk, uh, the neighboring district, approved them based on, I think, a lot of misinformation from CBP 
he was saying that like the towers would bring like better Wi-Fi signals um, and lead to repaving of roads, which has not happened. Um, however, because of this disagreement between the two districts, the number of towers was reduced from 16 to 10, so only along the border and not on the interior. Uh, so potentially some of this work may have had an effect, at least in the district we were working with, uh, to you know, convince them to oppose the towers. Uh, and so just a couple weeks ago, Nina and I went with Ophelia to the site where a few of the, the towers are now being, um, you know, the construction of them is starting. So here you can see um, a few images of the, the laying of the groundwork for that um, and the kind of heavy equipment that they're, they're bringing with them. And, and we did see this, you know, the, the infrastructure that was really being built to, to facilitate this, like the roads being created, um, you know, we were followed. There's, you know, a huge staging area with lots of heavy construction equipment. Uh, so it really does bring a larger uh, apparatus of border militarization with it. Um, but one thing that we also, you know, wanted to consider in this project um, was the role of maybe um, a less at the surface invasive uh, form of power, the environmental assessment or impact statement, which is ubiquitous in architecture and planning, um, but whose format goes kind of unquestioned. Its inherent biases and representational conventions are accepted as necessary for many construction projects, establishing default definitions for environment or impact without questioning how those words change among sites and contexts. By working within the strictures of the assessment, our project not only seeks to intervene in the violation of land rights and the tone of automation, it also asks how we can use our skills, you know, in architecture and design, as well as scholarship um, and research, to really challenge accepted formats of knowledge production and communication within our field and push to make them more equitable, dynamic, and accessible. Um, and so given that we, um, you know, these documents maybe weren't ultimately uh, successful in blocking the towers. We're now hoping to publish them and to continue to distribute this material as a way to um, encourage continued protest against, against these towers, um, but also to, to make this material available for other groups who are thinking about environmental assessments within their work. Um, so again, thank you so much for listening. Uh, that's the end of our, my presentation. <laughs>